Saturday Social is powered by EA Sports FIFA 23 with PlayStation. Only one place to start. Huge Monday night football. You're guessing why we might have a Man United and Liverpool fan on the show this week. That is because Monday night football is a blockbuster. Joe, is, are you going to watch it, Joe? <laughs> I'm going to be forced to watch it. I'm going to have to like pin my eyelids over. <laughs> I'm not looking forward there to it. There it is. Man United v Liverpool at uh, 6 they Cannot wait for it. Um, Flex, talk to me about Man United this season. 2-1 defeat to Brighton, followed by 4-0 defeat to Brentford. Currently bottom of the table. It is only... Well, when you reel it off like that... Yeah, I know. It's only... Can I was going to again? <laughs> <Sorry. Yeah. laughs> I was caveat it with we're only two games in, but you've been a Man United fan for a while. How worried are you about what's going on at the club right now? Yeah, it's very worrying. You can't, you can't dress it up. The, the mentality of the players is, has been bad. Um, the capitulations have been oh. bad, you know, the scattergun approach now in the transfer market, trying to get players in last minute. Um, it's just been bad. And, you know, I was on tour uh, with the lads as well. And you know what the funny thing is, is it looked all right. <laughs> <laughs> like, you know, a new manager. I, I You'll know. always have the Bangkok century uh, cup, mate. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's got lights in it, that and a fan, that trophy. It's heavy, yeah. um, that Bangkok trophy. Um, but, you know, you, there's a new manager coming in and you want to try and leave last season behind you yeah. as mm. much as you can and um, there was a little bit of a feel-good factor on, on pre-season you're thinking you know it's early doors but hopefully Eric Ten Hag can start building something and 15 minutes into the Brighton game it was a capitulation and, and back to square one probably even worse. Now. Talk to me about Ten Hag then when he came in obviously very high profile manager I know that you were excited D does that help elevate you does that improve the excitement or, or from what you've seen in the first two games has nothing changed? Because a lot, he's had critique already, but it's so early on, isn't it, into his race? It is so early on. The problem so is, is that Eric Ten Hag's got so much to fix in a squad yeah. That, yeah. that needs stripping down and rebuilding. And that's not going to be quick. You know, uh, we, we've done a lot of work with Ajax fans. And one of the things they said about him, even in the rebuild that, that he had at Ajax, is he needs time. Mm. Um, something that, of course, isn't afforded to a lot of managers, especially at Manchester United. Um, but like I said, there's so many issues, multifaceted issues at Manchester United that can't be fixed in one window, can't be fixed in two windows. Sometimes can't even be fixed in three, but you've got to start by having a good manager with a good philosophy. Um, and look, he's put his reputation on the line to come mm -hmm. to Manchester United. He's a, he's a progressive coach, one that is looking for the next step in his career and looking for that, 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 that next big job to kind of put himself onto the stage. And it could go horribly wrong at it's Manchester United or it could go really wrong. well. Yeah, yeah. You know? I'm worried, man. <laughs> So, so. <laughs> you, Joe, Joe, I've got to bring Joe in here because obviously you're a big Man United fan. You are, every time we look at the United game, you think we're not going to win, we're not going to win. So, so I, how worried are you? Is this, is this the most worried you've been as a United at, fan in your lifetime? Would you yeah, say? I think so. Because I, I'm not looking at a fixture at, at any stage at the moment thinking, we can get something out of this. Mm. We, can, we can really get something out of this. I mean, as a Liverpool fan, you must be looking on at Manchester United with some glee. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, look, I, but I live well, so. as, as a Liverpool fan through the, the 90s and the, and the noughties when Man United were on top. Mm. So I've got to yeah. take my enjoyment where I can where I can get it on top of all this. Like, but no, it's mad. It's, it's crazy to see where United are. But mm. it's mad that Liverpool and United don't seem to be able to exist at the top concurrently. Yeah, like you yeah, never see point. a Liverpool and United side toe to toe for the title. No. It, it, it very rarely, if ever, happens. Um, so obviously, what I mean is we need Man United to stay down the bottom because it means Liverpool are probably at the top as, as as a result of it. But he's got a big job, absolutely mm. ridiculously big job, and I just don't know whether I think Flex said it right. I think it's like it needs to be started again, pulled apart, started from zero. But how do you do that when you've got guys on? 250 grand a week and you're mm. well embedded in the contracts and stuff mm. how, do you, how, do you, how do you move those players on? Yeah mm. and we'll have a look at some of the transfers and squads in just a bit but I want to talk to you about Liverpool's start to the season as well because it's been it's been tricky but you're, play, you're still playing well but it's mm. been it's just been tricky points wise Yeah it, it has it's not in just in front of goal particularly it's not mm. been clicking it was, it was markedly better from Fulham to, to Palace and you know be interesting to see what would have happened if, if Nunes had just, <laughs> just kept his head a little bit you know to himself um, <laughs> perhaps <laughs> um, <laughs> Um, yeah, Liverpool were much better against against mm. Palace, and it's just not it's just not quite there yet. And that's the, that's one of those fears. Sometimes mm. is that you know we've seen many of those seasons where Liverpool in the past have had a good season, and the next season they've not not started well at all. And it normally leads to a disappointing season. We haven't had that under Klopp yet, but the, the, you know, again, I haven't been a Liverpool fan for long enough to remember yeah. that a little voice just Burn in the, the back of your mind could just do with a good win. And that's mad to say. Go to Old Trafford, needing a win is not a thing that I'm used to saying or ever happening as a Liverpool fan. Mm. So yeah, 
edgy. Edgy. Uh, well, it got us thinking, didn't it? Because yes. we looked at social media and a couple of people were saying that the start that Eric Ten Hag's had is quite similar to the start that Jurgen Klopp had in, in terms of what he's inherited, not, not the results, but in terms of what he's inherited. A lot of people were saying Jurgen Klopp actually, although he's had great success at the time, had a big rebuild, which Ten Hag has got now. So what we thought we'd do is look at Liverpool's first starting eleven and the squad under Jurgen Klopp mm. and the subsequent recruitment and now do the same for Ten Hag to see how, how many similarities, if any, there are there. So first up, let's have a look at Jurgen Klopp's first First ever starting 11. So this was against Spurs. It was it finished 0 0 at White Hart Lane, 17th of October 2015. Uh, Liverpool finished sixth of the season before, incidentally. So this was their starting lineup Mignolet, Klein, Skirtle, Sacco, Moreno, Lucas, Chan, then Lalana, Coutinho, and Milner in behind Origi. Listen to the sub for this game Bogdan, Torre, Randall, Alan, Ibe, Texera, and Sinclair. So, Paul, I've got to come to you first. What are your memories of this Liverpool 11 and, and looking at where you are now? compared to where you were then? It is, it's like the most shared graphic among Liverpool fans when we're, we're having a little tricky patch or whatever during the season of like, yeah. this is what it was like. Um, I was at that game and, I, and the thing that was marked about it was just how different Liverpool looked in one game of football under Jürgen Klopp. You know, they really? from Brendan Rodgers the, the, the week before where we'd we'd drawn in the Merseyside derby, we had a bunch of draws, disappointing disappointing games and then got came in and I think Liverpool, it was the first time anyone had outrun Spurs that season yeah. in, in that game. Yeah, Pochettino was big on that, wasn't yeah. he? The, yeah. the ground you covered and everything like that. Big time. And, so, and, and Adam Lallana kind of famously like basically falls off the pitch into Klopp's arms at the end of yeah. it, having run himself, run himself into the ground. And yeah, when you think about where we've come from and that, I mean the fact that Milner's pretty much the only guy there. Now, obviously yeah. Henderson was injured for that and for me, I was injured, yeah. but from that from that team. Milner. Yeah, you're right. From that squad, Milner's the only person there. I, I was going to ask you about that actually, because you finished sixth the season before, but then eighth in Klopp's first season. But you did get to the League Cup final and, and Europa League final at the yeah. time. So, did you see a dramatic improvement early with Klopp, or did it take time? To what Flex said, United have got with Ten Hag. It definitely took time, but what you see, and I've, I've said this to a, a few fans of footy teams who change the managers and look like Evertonians in particular about this. You've got to see something to grab Absolutely. onto. Mm. We went to we went to the Etihad not long into Klopp's reign and, and wiped the floor with them and they, they changed the system, put mm. Firmino into a false nine, went really high press, 4-3-3 and everyone went, ooh, mm. yeah, that. I think he's hit upon something, but he didn't quite have the players to do that system yeah. week in, week out. So we saw maybe seven or eight games in the first season of what actually you could recognise now as a Liverpool team, mm. and the rest he found ways to make it work. Mm. And that the League Cup run and the Europa League run, he put all the eggs in those baskets at the at the end of the season, kind of sacrificed the league, and obviously we fell short against Sevilla in the Europa League mm. final in the end. But it ended up being a really exciting team, totally rebirthed, like the Liverpool fan base travelling to Europe, singing mm. songs again. So yeah, we everyone says, oh, Klopp. We're on the league. Oh, we ate it. No one remembers that as a Liverpool fan. You just remember the, the other journeys. Great around. dance from Sturridge for his goal, wasn't it? Oh, yeah. <laughs> really great finish as well. Great Outside goal there. Yeah. Unbelievable. Flex, what was your sort of thoughts when you saw that Liverpool team there? It just shows you that the blueprint's there, doesn't it? Mm. It shows you that if you believe in a manager and you know, kind of build a team in his image and he's good enough to, to get a tune out of players early on and improve players, which you look at the players from there to now, mm. almost every signing under Jurgen Klopp, I'm, I'm struggling to think of one, maybe Naby Keita's maybe slightly, just you wanted a little bit more, but I'm struggling to think of a Klopp signing where you look at and say, well, he hasn't made them a better player. Mm. He hasn't yeah. elevated their game. Um, and that's what he does. And, and it's interesting you said there about you, you, you want to take something from it. OK, you might have finished eighth. Am I seeing progressive football? Am I seeing a style of football? Something Manchester United have been crying out for is identity. Yeah. Mm. We don't know, Joe, what the team's going to do agree. at mm. all. We, we, could, we could play one way on the back foot, counter-attacking football. Sometimes we might be trying to impose ourselves. Other times we're just completely wide open. There is zero identity yeah. with the squad. And... And if you're asking, you know, what a, what a successful season for Manchester United this season is, is forget top four. Yes, in the back of your minds, it's, you want to return back to Champions League football, but it's about de de developing an identity. Yeah. Yeah. Looking at the team and saying it's going to play in this way. And when you go a goal down, don't revert back to type. That's what we've already seen in the first two games. We can have a look at, at, at the team. We mentioned it there yeah. that, that started in Eric Ten Hag's first game co to compare it really to Jurgen Klopp's side. And when you talk about identity and changes, I mean, on paper, there are some, there are some big mm. names there and there's, there, there are some extremely talented players. But like you said, the identity just isn't there, is it? There's no relationships and, uh, um, and partnerships 
uh, in that team. I also think the fact that you played Ericsson as a false nine in game one, then you brought him back to almost like a defensive holding midfielder, then you yeah. moved him. It's like it's like almost like the, the, the system yeah. hasn't been sorted out, which you've got to say he, he does need time. Needs but, time. Paul, looking at that as a Liverpool fan, do you think that's a stronger on paper? I know they had their problems, but <laughs> is that a stronger team than? Don't the think one of those players saw? now. No, no, no. I know. Well, that's that, that's the problem. Sometimes is that you know you look at like San- Sancho's class. Ericsson's yeah. class. Rashford, I know you guys don't like him anymore for some reason, but he's brilliant. Um, Fernandez is good. Maguire, you know, obviously he's fallen foul of it, you know, a lot of United fans, whatever, but he's a good centre half. David De Gea, okay, football's moved on a bit, but he's still a decent goalie. Mm. You're right, that's a good, that's a, that's a good, good base for a manager to come into. Exactly, isn't it? yeah, yeah. And that, but that's the thing you, I think people forget sometimes is the clock didn't just get given. Mm. You know, he didn't just get given time, he didn't just give him players. He earned it, he comes in yeah. on a short term contract, but and wins the, the, wins the respect to the fans wins respect of the, of the ownership structure and is rewarded with being, with time but do you think he'll just give them time do you think it's harder for I know that we talk about it, him having a better team Eric Ten Hag but do you think it's harder for him to enact a specific style of play on a team when he's got higher calibre names and, and, and personalities that think they know best almost whereas when Jurgen Klopp came into you know Origi and Lallana he can go you're going to run into the ground that's, for me that's a huge difference Jurgen Klopp was the best signing Liverpool ever made that was like I remember when Zidane left Juventus and like everyone wanted Zidane mm. you know what I mean and then you, you know, Real Madrid get him and you go wow that's a statement because you know yeah. you've gone and got the best player in, on the planet now plays for your team we knew we'd gone and got the, the best manager you could get and that carries like an assurance with it and that's the thing about Ten Hag, he's a good manager, but there's probably minimum three better managers than him in, in the league until he proves otherwise, yeah. of course. Yeah. And when you've got a lot of big egos who've been there and done that, had, Solskjaer had exactly the same problem. You know, and you've got guys who are like, well, mate, I've, I, I know more than you. I've won yeah. more than you ever uh, ever won. Um, you've got to have a big personality to get over that. And Klopp, never a great player, but he, he, he carried a, he's got a charisma and he's got his power of personality yeah. and obviously the success he's had at Dortmund. Do you think on that, Ten Hag, obviously we knew it was a challenge taking taking the job on, but do you think he now that he's there, he realises this is even more of a challenge than I originally thought? This is a, a baptism of fire. I was up in the gantry at, um, at the Brentford Community Stadium and I just looked at Eric Ten Hag and I thought, <sighs> he realises this is massive yeah. now. You know, again, on tour... It's all happy. It's all relaxed. There's no pressure. Um, it's all smiles. You're trying to, you know, the team building and, and, you, and, you, and you want to believe in him. And I do believe in him, but I just feel like these first two games, um, the stuff going on, you know, with players maybe leaving, coming in, what's mm-hmm. going on. Um, and then most of all, the media, um, the baptism of fire in terms of losing those games in the way that he did. He will be looking at that, that now. And if he didn't realise before, he will be saying, this is a massive, massive task. And a big part of it is recruitment, as, as you've been saying for, for yeah. many, many times. So I think, again, another comparison we want to look at is the players that Jurgen Klopp's brought in and then we'll look at yeah. what Ten Hag needs to do. Because this... I've got to say, the recruitment from Liverpool is quite frankly phenomenal. Worth pointing out, this isn't all the signings under Jurgen Klopp. There have been some that, that haven't been as successful. Uh, but this is some of the main signings. Um, he spent £700 million since taking charge, but has received £525 million in transfer fees. We had to get that checked with stats. Yeah, didn't we? stats it's unbelievable, because isn't it? We, we didn't believe it at the time because it was just incredible. He's only spent roughly £175 net spend. Million. But that is true. Um, but, but £175 <laughs> million. Pounds, yeah, that, that would be <laughs> really good, wouldn't it? Really good. <laughs> um, but look at some of these signings. I mean, Sadio Mane for 30 million, Matip for a free. I won't read them all out, but Salah, uh, 43, under 45 million for Salah, which is incredible. Van Dijk, obviously that's a lot of money, but widely regarded as one of the greatest centre-backs in the world. I mean, even Diogo Jota at the time, people were saying, oh, 45 million, but his goals to game ratio is, is, is incredible. Um, Obvious question, Paul, but this has been massive reason for Klopp's success. The recruitment has been incredible. Hasn't yeah, it? absolutely, and that's that's the joined-up thinking at Liverpool that isn't on show at Manchester United. Mm. It is Liverpool put a director of football in place, but Michael Edwards and Klopp actually trusts the people mm. around him. He, like he, he he loves experts. He loves being able to say you know like draw upon the knowledge mm. of other people around him. He's got his ideas, but if it was left totally to him, like Liverpool would have brought in Mario Goethe, they might have brought in Julian Brandt, yeah, and instead Liverpool get Sadio Mane and Mohamed Salah. Mm. Two of the greatest players to play for the football. And worth putting out players like Andy Robertson as well, under under ten million at the time, people were unsure. I mean, look look at him. But from now, Hull, rele- relegated player with yeah. Hull, we did the same with uh, Gini Van Alden from Newcastle as well. And even like Jaden Jakir, he's not on that list, but you know, yeah. he, he came from Stoke and he, you know, has a pivotal part in Liverpool beating Barcelona. I was gonna ask you, who's who's the, the, the best value for money signing out of all of them there? Because there's so many good ones. Is there one that you single out and go, that was the key? It, value for money's mad because you, you you I guess you want me to go oh, Andy Robertson or something for ten, yeah. but 
it's, it's either Virgil or Alisson. I know, yeah, and we broke the transfer record for a centre half and for yeah. a, and for a goalkeeper with both of those. But what they've brought to Liverpool, it, mm. they've elevated everything. No one remembers the price, do they? You know, the, mm. the Harry Maguire situation is oh, I was 85 million. Ultimately, what what justifies a player's value is how well they perform. Mm. You know, nobody's saying like, can't believe they paid that for Van Dijk. And Man United mm. have had so many of the, exactly that exactly. over the years. I mean, I don't know if you guys saw it, but on Monday Night Football they did the list of red, amber, green mm. Manchester United transfers. We have watched it now, and it is pretty ugly watching for a Manchester United <laughs> fan. <laughs> It's been one of the problems that Manchester United have had for 10 years is that they've flip-flopped between different managers and different strategies and allowed managers to influence the actual overall recruitment. Uh, and that's been a massive issue. And we did a little exercise earlier on today and we looked at the last 10 years of signings, the major signings at the club. And we categorised them into green. Have they provided value for money and have they performed for the club? Have they done OK and been OK value? Or have they been poor value and not performed? Or one of the two. 75% of those signings are red. They've not worked. You know, 20% are an amber. And basically only 4 or 5% of, we think, the club signings in the last 10 years have worked. Ooh. I mean, that is a damning, damning indictment Scaven. of Manchester United's recruitment. We can, we can flash that graphic back up yeah. again because obviously wow. there's a lot of names on there that have and haven't worked. I mean, Flex, mm. this is just poor, isn't it? It makes a horrible, horrible read and, and, and that's why recruitment and agreeing on a strategy and staying with it and then backing managers and not changing every so often is so, so key. You know, it burns as a Manchester United fan to have to look at Liverpool and what they've done and say, well, that's what we need to do. That, 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 is, that is it. I look at those players on there. Massive, massive wages, massive, massive transfer fees. Um, and even some of them, I think, are probably... But are United bit learning? Well. We see, we've seen, we've seen mm. over the last 24 hours that they've agreed a deal for, for Casemiro. Would, would, Cas, would Jurgen Klopp and the, man, and the Liverpool board you know, of Michael Edwards have, have targeted a player like Casemiro, who's 30, on huge wages at 60 million? It's telling that the only player close to that age they brought in was Thiago. And, mm. and, and, and again, you can see that mm. some of the negatives yeah. of that, just in terms of his fitness and availability, but like he's a guy and they, they target attitude rather than name. It's personality as mm. well as skill set. You know, Jürgen Klopp likes to put the finishing touches. That's like, it's a bit old school, but looks into the whites of the eyes and, and, and kind of gets a measure of the yeah. person and decides, will you fit in with what I want? Are you going to work? That's more important than how many medals you've won or mm. you know, how big your profile is, how many Instagram And like you, you said, Jürgen would have wanted some set, like slightly different players potentially to what the Liverpool board have, uh, have actually ended up bringing in, whereas United seem to have gone really back to Ten Hag's like... Sandro Martinez, mm. the chase for Anthony, yeah. uh, Tyrone Malasia. So it's it, one or the other with Manchester. It, it seems to be no, can we, it, we, we, we go from you know looking at a, a mismatch of players to then going okay, we're going to hand over the recruitment side of it all to the manager and then get, get all players that he knows and he trusts mm. in. And if that doesn't work, bets, then you're going to be stuck with the, that. The covering bets when you get a superstar because worst case scenario is you'll, you'll sell a bunch of merchandise and you'll increase, mm. increase the club's profile a little bit. And if you don't have a, a successful season, well at least off the pitch you've managed to maintain yeah. your sources of revenue or whatever. I was going to mention that. It's a good point that Paul makes because at the time, I think back to my Man United mates who, who were reacting to those signings, there were some huge signings at the time. A lot of those names weren't unestablished players. No. or I mean, the likes of Pogba, Ronaldo, Varane, Di Maria, even Sanchez, Lukaku. Slatter. These were all proven players that, that a lot of United fans were buzzing about that we all thought, you know, we heard pundits saying that this could elevate United to mm. top four to title challenges, even some people say. So why has it gone so badly wrong for so many established players at United, do you think? I just think if you bring, if you bring players who have uh, fantastic careers and, 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 you know, great numbers into a, a culture that, that isn't quite right, you end up kind of falling into it. You can't, it's not enough to change it by yourself. So I just think that the, the, the key at Manchester United, as we've learned, isn't how big the names are, isn't what they've done in world football before then. It's what are they walking into? Mm. Who are the leaders? Who can they learn off? Who can they, who can they elevate with and bring the club forward with? And do, do the club have a sustainable way of thinking of recruitment instead of just going for the, the glamorous names with the, with the big prices? And once you do it once or twice, you should be able to learn. And yeah. what Manchester United haven't done with recruitment is continuing in that vein it's what they the did reset the button just doesn't get pressed and again I keep using Arsenal as like a measuring stick and only to a certain point because they still have to go and achieve something now with Mikel mm. Arteta but what they did do was stop 
hit the reset button, say, listen, we're going to have to take a lot of flack for this. We're going to have to get rid of the likes of Aubameyang. We're going to have to get rid of Ozil. We're going to have to get rid of some fan favourites and some mm. players who are on massive wages. And Mikel, you're going to have to take the flack for this. Mm. But we believe that this will be the best way forward and we'll be able to have a team that is a team. Mm. Exactly that, a mm. team. And Manchester United haven't done that yet. OK, very quickly, score prediction for Monday Night Football. You said 4-0 <laughs> United off camera. <laughs> Go on, quick, quick prediction. Um, 2-0 Liverpool. 2-0 Liverpool, wow. <laughs> hey, on, what are you going with? Oh, well, I can't, yeah, 2-0 Liverpool. I, I, hopefully it'll be more. 2-0? 2-0 Liverpool. If United, if, if United keep it below five, they've done well. Are, are United fans taking a 2-0 defeat at this oh, stage? I said last week, 3-1 Brentford. It was 4-1. Yeah. Harry Blair on the show actually said 4-0 Brentford, didn't yeah, he? Yeah, I reckon it, it could be five or six. It wow. could be bad. United but but do you know what? Hang on, just really quickly. Go you on. never know. You know, they could be out of the title race by then and we could be above them if we get the win. So You're just saying that. Because yeah. some Liverpool fans, because I, I think about it, you, you do have to give it. We are still fans, Joe. You can't just completely concede. Yeah. People He's know just worried really about the United fans watching us now. We, so he's we really think it that, but United you know. fans at home are saying the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I take it back. Then it's fine. Oh, there we go. There are the predictions. <laughs> very interesting. Can't wait for Monday Night Football.